In 2012, scientists claimed they found the God particle, this question, this troubling missing factor of our weight, our hold, our value they claim. And yet, yet we have no evidence except the collision of values. Most of what we know and how we see ourselves is determined by five Western countries, five of which determine value by how well they kill others. And we out here screaming, black lives matter, as in exists or takes up space, as in atoms, molecules, as in mass. Ain't there some funny irony there? I'm starting to believe that this is all we value is each other's death more than life. And if life's so valuable, how come? How so? It's not lost on me that death is part of life. Some die so others live. But who? Who is doing all the dying exactly at the expense of all this living? And are you really being? This week on the show, resistance and revolutionary poetry. Spoken word poet Aja Monet talks about free speech, accountability, the poet June Jordan, and the fight for Palestinian liberation. All that and her new book, My Mother Was a Freedom Fighter. It's all coming up on The Laura Flanders Show, the place where the people who say it can't be done take a back seat to the people who are doing it. Welcome. Our next guest's poetry collection is called My Mother Was a Freedom Fighter. So what does it mean to be a freedom fighter in today's America? What about globally? Aja Monet thinks deeply about the meaning of solidarity and revolution, revolutionary solidarity, you might say. What's it look like, and not just on the page or in performance, but in our lives? She's a poet, activist, recording studio co-owner, and she is an outspoken supporter of the Palestinian people. I'm happy to welcome her to the studio. Aja, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you for having me. So uh, everyone wants to know, was your mother a freedom fighter and what did that mean? Well, yes, I talk about freedom fighting um, in, a, in a more, I, I don't want to say nuanced because I don't like that word too much these days, but I try to complicate what that means. Um, there's always the, the, the idea that you have to be a part of a specific social justice movement or organized front in order to quote unquote, be defined as a freedom fighter. And I think um, the title comes from a title poem that, that is about the role women and mothers and caretakers and nurturers have played um, in creating society and trying to exist and have the right to exist and to um, be free. And so I, in some ways, make the argument of the case that any woman that tends to oneself and tries to, to upbring and raise others is a freedom fighter because in and of itself it means that you are doing um, an act of, of resistance to the mainstream pretty much masculine way of doing things. Um, and so, you know, when mothers are trying to make the world in some way a better place and doing the best they can and how they aren't often supported by society. Um, shows that we have a lot of work to do. Now tell me a little bit about your background, where you came from, who, what educated you. I heard the other day that you went to Saint La to Sarah Lawrence. Yes. So I'm originally from Brooklyn, New York. My mother is a longtime Brooklynite and New Yorker. I was raised by a single mother. She had three kids. I have an older brother, a younger sister. Um, you know, she did her best to try to keep a roof over our heads and make sure we went to school. School was probably the most important thing for her was that we got an education. She saw the opportunities that other people who went to school had, and she knew that she wanted her kids to be able to participate in some of those things. And the thing with New York is once you're in a district, you can go to any other school in that district thereafter. So once I got into to the district, I was able to go into middle school, a really good middle school, then into a really great um, high school. So I went to Eastside Middle, then to Baruch College Campus High School, which is a magnet school. And then I ended up going over to Sarah Lawrence. 
And um, Sarah Lawrence was pretty, it was, it was a great school because the whole impetus of the school is kind of, it has a fight in it. There's a lot of women who've come through that school. Who, Grace um, Paley taught there, a lot yeah. of activist inclined professors. I mean, Alice Walker least. spent some time there. She had her little her critiques of the school because, sure. of course, you know, you deal with um, a lot of things in, in all white institutions. But for the, for the, the, the most part, it was my introduction to critical thinking skills and how do I start to make a difference in the world and make my own ideas. Were you up. always sure you were going to be a poet? I was pretty certain about it because once I was in high school and uh, I knew writing was something I yeah. loved. I knew reading was something I loved. It was just something that was recurring in my yeah. life. I loved diaries, journal entries. And then I got involved with an organization called Urban Word NYC, which was provides um, free performance poetry workshops, et cetera, opportunities for young inner city kids. Yeah, I should have said you are a slam poetry star, <laughs> right? You won one of the downtown slam contests. Yeah, not so much anymore. I stopped doing slam poetry, but when you I- your, You got your award and, and skedaddled. Yeah, because <laughs> it was the only way that uh, I felt quote unquote what people call spoken word, but speaking your poems was as mu as important yeah. as what how you wrote a poem. Well, and so, that was an avenue for us. So let's talk about that for a minute. I mean, for a lot of people, the model of a, of a poet or a writer is a sort of recessive one. Like you're off in your garret somewhere, or maybe you teach a class, but it's a solo activity. Not at all for you. I mean, maybe the writing is in solitude, but where did you get that picture of the well, you think you've called it engaged witnessing, the engaged work as a poet. Yeah, so I feel like um, I didn't know what it was that I, like why my process was different. I didn't, when I was coming up, I think you, you, you're you trying to find the language, you're trying to find community. Um, but I knew that I found community among the poetry performance community and the workshops and open mics and going to slams. And I saw that people were coming together and cared and were really passionate about this metaphor and how someone explained or was able to articulate this. Um, so I knew that there was something about writing that was very different for me than most writing institutions. And then I started to read more and more and I stumbled on a book uh, by June Jordan and it was a collection of her essays. And she talked about, um, there's one essay where she talks about going away and writing in this like home and she ends up, you know, sadly going through a rape, I believe. Yeah, long and long. she talks about, um, she starts to address the difficulty or the conversation around like, oh, living in solitude and having the right to solid, so the, the idea that writers should be in solitude. And she fa she found in that moment that that was actually not what was she was used to and that's not what she needed. She needed community in that moment. And something about that experience taught her that, oh, the illusion is that a writer needs to be in solitude in order to really access them, their inner interior world, but that, no, there, is, there are writers who are more, um, that feel more close to their interior world because of their community. So I, I found the language for that. And in that, I started to say, oh, well, I don't want to be in more writer residencies where I'm set, set aside away from my community and therein I become estranged from my community. I want to be immersed in my community writing and I want to see how that's going to affect my writing. And June, whom I was very close with, was also, as you are now, very dedicated to Palestine. Yeah. And her community extended all the way to the Palestinian people and others too. How did you get involved in the work around Palestine and the rights of the Palestinians? Uh, my first introduction to the struggle for Palestinian liberation was by the name of a young woman, uh, Tahani Salah. She's a young poet who also was a part of Urban Word NYC, which was a lot of my politicized like education. I mean, poetry for me was never separate of the political because there was, those are the spaces before this current movement moment where people were talking about black lives mattering and talking about police brutality and sexual abuse and gender violence and all these things. They were speaking out against these things. At the time it was kind of taboo because you go into a poetry and you're like, oh God, they're gonna be talking about this stuff. <laughs> you know. But now people see what they were doing and what they were trying to do with poetry. And so Tahani was the one that was you know, always writing poems about this. And then I started to read more. Suhair Hamad was writing about it. I learned about June Jordan. So that was my introduction to kind of understanding. They said they were victims. They said you were Arabs. They called your apartments and 
gardens, guerrilla strongholds. They called the screaming devastation that they created the rubble. Then they told you to leave, didn't they? Didn't you read the leaflets that they dropped from their hotshot fighter jets? They told you to go, 135,000 Palestinians in Beirut. And why didn't you take the hint, go? There was the Mediterranean. You could walk into the water and stay there. What was the problem? I didn't know, and nobody told me, and what could I do or say anyway? Yes, I did know it was the money I earned as a poet that paid for the bombs and the planes and the tanks that they used to massacre your family, but I am not an evil person. The people of my country aren't so bad. You can't expect but so much from those of us who have to pay taxes and watch American TV. You see my point? I'm sorry. I really am sorry. A few years fast forward, um, I build a relationship with a woman by the name of Metha Al Hassan, who we met at the um, Abi Odun Oyewoli's home of the last poets, who's been like a mentor, a godfather to me. And she was doing work on Arab American, African American solidarity. And she was helping Ahmed Abu Naid from Dream Defenders. Um, do this delegation where they wanted to bring black activists, writers, uh, just influential people to Palestine to learn about what was, to see for themselves what is, what is going on and how that relates to the state violence that's going on mm. here. And so she, she was like, I think a poet needs to be on the delegation, which was unique for her to, to, to insert because, you know, most of the people on the yeah. delegation were community organizers or activists. And she saw, you know, Malcolm X, she studied a lot of Malcolm X's letters and she would see that he loved poetry and he would quote, you know, Arabic poetry and he would, he would talk about a lot how the poetry was a part of how he was politicized. So it was a connection made there. We played some of the video of your Dream Defender delegation to Palestine when we had uh, Patrice Cullors on the show. Mm. And Patrice talked about the similarities of the connections that the people in the Movement for Black Lives and the Palestinian people found. Um, on that trip. Some of that is now taking the form of continued activism around the relationship between the Israeli Defense Forces, their military, their army, and U.S. police departments. It's called Deadly Exchange. Um, do you want to talk at all a little bit about that or share any of that sense of where the connections are as you've come to learn more about them? Well, as I learned about those connections, I haven't been working uh, a lot in that. I know Patrice is trying to do a little bit more about making those connections. Um, for the movement and, and being able to really illustrate what those are. For us, what we learned was that, you know, we, we talk and we are often um, try to uplift the, 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 the counter narrative of what police, policing has done and how it's been, de you know, how it has dehumanized black people in this country um, and the ways in which black people are not protected. And we talk a lot about after Ferguson, the militarization of policing. And that was the biggest thing that really shocked yeah. young activists was that, you know, you have tanks coming into neighborhoods and you have people in riot gear and, you know, just it, it, it didn't you didn't feel very strangely. You realize you weren't American very quickly. Right. You felt like you were in a war zone. And so in that we had Mariam Barghouti, who was um, a Palestinian young woman who was sending tweets to folks in Ferguson and making those connections like this is how you deal with tear gas. This is how you respond to. Uh, militarized police, you know, and then we found out in in more conversation that there are many police officers who get trained in Israel and vice versa who come here, and so there is a direct correlation between this state violence that is that is happening in our communities, and I think we're trying to find ways to um, dismantle this relationship and to make it so that Americans are more aware of where their tax dollars yeah. are going. You also have talked about love and the, the positive agenda that you embrace as you do this work. Because I, I, I think that that's part of the changed narrative too. Mm -hmm. The sense that solidarity, I'm doing something in support of you as opposed to we're in this together. And actually, it feels good. June was always used to say, you want to make the movement look as sexy as possible. You want to make it something that people want to be part of. Um, how do you do that in your work, and how do you think about what that word solidarity means? One of the things that Audre Lorde said, I remember her quoting or paraphrasing about June Jordan, was that 
her role as a writer was to make revolution irresistible. And so for me, I feel like I've always wondered, what does that mean? What is, how do you make revolution irresistible? Um, and I try to be very conscious of, in the conversation I have about solidarity, pushing that word and what we, what we define that word to be. And also so that people that see us, um, the work we're doing are aware that we're not in this because we're sitting around moping all the time and, and, and sad and, and just angry showing up to protests. And, you know, we need you at the protests. We need you at the, the rallies. We need you, yes, at the actions. But we also need you when we need food on the table and when we want to laugh and dance and, and, and dream together. And so our solidarity is not just about our shared struggle. It's also about our shared joy and our shared visions and, and aspirations for each other as, as human beings in the world. And so solidarity is now, well, how do we bring soul? And we talk about solidarity um, these days as coined by this uh, young uh, rapper, Vic Mensa, in our last delegation to Palestine. But we've been trying to grapple with, yeah, like what is it that we need that's beyond the, the practical of the word, you know? And more and more, we want to be able to show that we have, we have, we have shared um, imaginations, and we want to we want to decolonize our imaginations. We want to say, oh, not if Palestine's free. We want to say when Palestine's free. We want, we don't want to say, oh, if black people are free in the country. We want to say when black people are free. We we try to speak it into existence so that therein, it it restructures our DNA. It restructures our spirit and how we walk and how we hold our head. Two last questions, kind of practical things. You started a studio. Mm -hmm. in Florida, yeah. smoke signals. Mm -hmm. uh, how's that going and why'd you do it? It's, it's going good. It brings me a lot of joy. And um, one of the things I talked about at the event I was, we were at last night was like, how do we create what we want to see? What are the, thing, what are the ways that we start to um, bring people into the spaces so that we're not just figuratively talking about liberation and freedom and equality, but we're actually creating those spaces. And so Dream Defenders is working a lot to try to give examples locally um, in South Florida of what that looks like and how do we create free zones and how do we create spaces where everyone there is honored. And black people in this country have always, you know, our music has always been ex exported and exploited and, and seen as like, oh, they do that well, it's very entertaining. But I think people don't really understand that it's a praxis of liberation and it's a way in which we, we become the things we want to see. And so we've been creating jam circles and sessions and we do um, incredible nights of just great live music and people come and, and, and speak their truth and they sing and they wail and they dance and they laugh and they cry together and we get through the tough times. And in that, we start to imagine and, and work towards what we want for our communities and what we want for ourselves as a free society. And we try to create discipline and love around those um, those practices and and around that space. And so, we're hoping to create more magazines. Like we want to do, we're do we are doing zines. Um, we're doing a mixtape right now where we're trying to. It's called the Free Tape, and we're working on remixing pop culture songs as freedom songs. And so, trying to find ways to reach our young people and get them to really be engaged and see. Oh yeah, you could have a really cool beat, but also be like practicing freedom. So Smoke Signals for me is a call to our community. It's a call to action. It's uh, intentional messaging. And how do we start to there, therein create the world we want to see? Final question. You were on a forum talking about the boycott, divestment, and sanctions campaign and the whole question of free speech on campus. Um, Ironically, in an age of rising rights, white supremacy and fascism in America, we're seeing debates over free speech on campus and laws that were passed ostensibly to stop the speech of bigots being challenged as shutting down the speech of those very same bigots. So a lot of people thought that they were passing hate speech laws um, in the 90s to protect endangered groups. It's not how it's playing out. Um, how do you think about it and what's your advice to people who are maybe on campuses where white supremacists want to speak and the temptation is very strong to say no they can't? They have the right to say whatever they want. Everyone should have the right. I believe in the right to free speech. Um, however, I think you have to deal with the repercussions of what you say and how you say it. And we're in a day and age where social media has allowed 
embolden people in a way that they can get on, they can say something, there's no accountability. Um, there's a comedian, I forget his name, who talks about, he says, it says a lot about white America when you see the be, be, two biggest rights that they, that they make is free speech and then right after that, the right to bear arms. <laughs> And he says part of it is because, you know, they want to say whatever they want to say and they know they're going to need a gun after it. So <laughs> I think the reality is people aren't, aren't ready to deal with the accountability yeah. of what they say and how they say it. And they, 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 they attack that by saying, oh, well, political correctness, we're in an age of too much political correctness. And I don't think that that's true. I think we're in an age of getting wiser and being um, more intentional with our language and seeing how language creates the world and arranges the world around you. And so if you are very careless with what you say, that means it says a lot about your character and how careless you are about the life you lead. Yeah. And so I think free speech is, is, yes, it's a right everybody has. However, I think you should be concerned with how you use free speech and the ways in which you use your language and what things you say speak into and speak over people um, and how that will shape the world. So for me, I think that there's a, a role that we all have to play in allowing people to speak and also getting people to listen. Yeah. We need more active listeners and we need people, we teach a lot of people, and I say this a lot with young folks, we teach young people, oh, your voice, speak up, speak your voice. We don't teach people how to listen. Mm -hmm. We don't teach, there's no class for how to be an active audience member or an active participant in a conversation. So I think the fight against free speech is a lot, has a lot to do with belief. And belief is a dangerous thing, goes back to Palestine. I think anytime you do things based off of some belief and you, you don't examine your convictions, you're liable to become indoctrinated mm -hmm. to some sort of religious hysteria, you know? And so I think we have to be very open to challenging ourselves and how we use language and, and listening to other people and how they use language. I think I was just in Detroit and I think Grace Lee Boggs used to say, um, listen with the intensity that most people reserve for speaking, mm. <laughs> which I think is a good way of looking at it. I'm going to keep on listening to you, Aja. It's really a pleasure it. to have you uh, in the struggle and in the show. Thank you so much. We're going to hear more of Aja Monet's poetry right after this. Years of a sun loving us. Solitude is in the wrist of a magnolia tree hung or lynched in a rose-throated croon of liberty and justice for all except blues people live in the smoke at a crossroads. What really happened that day when Robert Johnson brought his guitar to meet in evil of all hues? Play with magic and be ready for it to play with you. Some folks fear death, others know better fear the devil. Don't sell no soul to spite dying. We all have to go someday or another. Death is a family member you hear of but never met until y'all meet. Some things is meant for telling, other things just is what they was. I have faced worse things than being forgotten. Though you call me woman whom you do not know, I am a daughter of sisters, of pillaged offerings, an afterlife of secrets, scores of lustering light. I summon you bravely beside me, marching onward. Move not for reason, but love. Any law that deviates from this is as cruel as it is ancient. Let your words be soothing terrors. Never mind what was written, we will rewrite it. An idea of freedom is all we know. Our inheritance is to lift one another. We shift into a gust or bristles between strands of hair, ashes of breath raging in quiet. What land is ours to toss and turn over, if not our bodies? The dunes across chest, the legs, all roads, arms, a meadow of marigolds. We survive and regret surviving. We are descendants of the end. We see the end. Fences, barbed wire, stone walls, and iron gates do not impede truth. 
Nations cannot foresee our being here in this vessel of marrow and sweat, having made it across the bayous of a dark mother's womb and all that tried her, pushing through treacherous attempts at our lives. Fear not what of me resides in you, a shawl of waiting, hankering to be felt. What ails is what ails. Wild visions leave, doors unlock, days veterans return from combat, injured arms slung close to chest, loyal to a beat or nub. I am a country within a country. Retire, rest a while, woke and worrying, my beloved. We take to the streets as a sort of rain, descending atop roofs of all those who make laws to define the absence between us. Peculiar spirit who aspires for such things, to possess a people. What sin hunts hearts, the birds, the fish, the cattle, the islands of what is kept sacred to nurture is to resist in all forms. We heal, we must work the land before we make claims to it. What endures the body is the body. When we left our mother's belly, we did not take any land. Only thing we took was the weapon of her smile and the elixir of her love. Enjoying what you see here? Prefer perhaps to listen? Sign up for our free podcast and receive a bonus F-word commentary every week, direct to your inbox. Sign up at The Laura Flanders Show at lauraflanders.com or wherever it is you get your podcasts. Thanks. (music) 